right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about what Ruby developers can learn from Go. Um, my name is Lionel Barrow. Oh, that did not work. Uh, you can. <laughs> I'm on the inner tweet, says at Lionel Barrow, and you can email me at Lionel Barrow at getbraintree.com. It's spelled the same way it's spelled on my shirt. Um, I work for Braintree. Braintree is a credit card payment processing company, and I'm, I'm just curious, do we have any merchants in the room th uh, who are Braintree customers? One, two, three, four. All right, great. If you guys can come talk to me after the talk, uh, half the reason why they're willing to send me to a conference is so I can meet with you guys and get feedback, and you know, we love to support our merchants. We'd love to get anything, you know, we can hear from you, it'd be awesome. All right, so we're gonna talk about Go. Um, when I first started writing this talk, I wasn't sure the right way to go. Should I start with a whole bunch of like programming language discussion or should I just sort of dive in? And I think that I'm gonna begin by diving into Go and then stepping back a little bit, bit and having the overall discussion. So this talk might be a little bit at the beginning repetitive for those of you who've already tried out the language, but it should be accessible for everyone. Um, what is Go? Go is a new programming language. Uh, it's compiled, garbage collected, strongly typed, object oriented, with little asterisks um, on the object orientedness. It was developed mostly by Google over the last five or six years, and it's actually extremely young. Uh, the V1 spec has only been frozen for about 18 months, um, and I think they just put out 1.1 about two weeks ago. Um, I have to keep checking to see. Can you guys read these slides in the back? It's doing different things with the font. Okay, cool. Um, so Go is open source, and I think that if Google decided that it was the next project that they want to just completely ax uh, randomly, that it would keep going, but it has been driven in part because some very talented people and a lot of hard work is going into it at Google. Um, and I don't think they will ax it. If you, if you watch some of the talks that all the various luminaries uh, uh, have been giving about the language, it's clear that it, Go is intended to be a core part of Google's en engineering infrastructure for a long time. Um, so there's a lot of interest in this language in part because it has first class concurrency constructs, uh, routines, channels, buffers, all that sort of stuff. Um, there's no time to talk about this today, but I'll be definitely willing to talk about them in Q&A or in, uh, if you guys come up to me afterwards. Um, we also won't be able to talk about the crippled metaprogramming and sort of lack of generics and all these sort of features that you might have heard are a little bit missing from the language. Um, Although I think you might get a sense of why they are missing over the course of the talk. Uh, and we won't be able to talk about GoFumpt or GoFix or GoPath or any of the other tool chain related stuff. Uh, Go is almost a regular language. You can almost parse it just, you know, very easily. And that has allowed people to create some very cool tools for manipulating Go uh, from the command line, which is pretty awesome, but we won't have time to talk about it. Okay, so here's the thing to know about Go. Go is not, uh, very welcoming to a lot of different styles of writing code. Go has an agenda. And everything about the language is designed to push you towards writing Go the way he wants you to write it. That's Rob Pike. He's one of the leads. We're just gonna pick on Rob, because he is the public facing guy. So um, the language designers have a very specific way of thinking about how Go programs should be written. And you're gonna keep getting prodded and pushed all the way down to force you to write the code in that way. Um, and the first thing you have to think about when you're gonna sit down and say, oh, I'm gonna write a program in Go, is you have to make your peace with that. You have to say, is that okay? Um, in my experience, if you accept effective Go style, then it works. If you try to fight against it, it doesn't work. And sometimes this means that you have to go down paths that the language is like pushing you towards that rub against your sort of natural inclination as a Rubyist. I don't think Ruby does have an agenda. I think that Ruby is so syntactically and semantically flexible that you can program it in many, many different styles in Ruby. That doesn't mean that we don't have idioms, right? When was the last time you guys saw a for loop in Ruby code? No, you say like array.each, right? But Ruby is flexible. Ruby does not have an agenda and Go does. So what is Go's agenda? We're gonna get into that. Uh, by looking at a couple, uh, four specific design decisions about the language and sort of thinking about how they might look in Ruby. And I want you to keep in mind, what are the design goals here and why have the language designers made this choice? Because it's not, it's not by accident. There's a great talk by Rob Pike called Go at Google in which he lays out the very specific engineering challenges that they designed the language to overcome. And it's very clear that every design decision made here is made very deliberately. Uh, there's an intended style. So. 
in Go, declaration of a variable is different from assigning the variable uh, a state. So this looks very simple. Like, here's our main package. This is basically what Go source code looks like. You have a main, you have a package name at the top of the source file. Um, in main, that's the one that actually executes. It's very similar to a lot of other languages. You, say, can, you can say var a int, that's declaring it, and then assign it to be one. If you try to just say b equals two, that's a compiler error because b has not been declared. But you do have a shortcut for just say c is declared and assigned to be three at the same time. So what is the design decision here? Uh, <laughs> Eliminate stray variables and dependencies. It is a compiler error in Go to import a package and not use it. It's a compiler error to declare a variable and not use it in some way. And sort of these decisions have made it easier for you to just read over the source code and see what you're doing and what you're not doing. Okay, second design decision. Oh man, I'm gonna keep having to do this. Sorry about this. Uh, exporting values from packages is controlled by the case of the value. So. Go is oriented around this notion of a package. If you guys have ever worked in Python, you have a notion of you can import from a specific source file. Uh, you import specific values. So Go is similar in, except that packages span multiple source files. And you can sort of just think of them as a namespace. A package is a namespace that exports certain values to other packages and leaves other ones inside of itself. And so within um, a single package, even if it's multiple source files, you can reference like private internal package only methods, even though they're in different files. Um, so here's an example of that. We have a Braintree package. It has a credit card struct. If you guys have never worked in a language that's not Ruby, the, the type credit card struct is a little bit like a class declaration in that we're saying what the attributes of the class are, except that the methods of the class, there's no methods declared here, but if we were to declare them, they would not be in the same block of code. Um, so last four is a public attribute of credit card. Number is not. We know that just by looking at the case of the variable. It also follows the same rules of the package level. Credit card is public. Charge card is also public. Validate card and run transaction are not. So client code for this package might look like this. You have your main, you import Braintree, the package. You, have, you import Fumpt, which is just for printing that stuff out and formatting strings. And you can say, my card is declared to Braintree.credit card, you know, with some, uh, some a last four and a credit card number, which is actually just pi. Um, you can then say braintree.charge card, and you notice how all the functions here are namespaced, and yeah, it all works out pretty well. So what is the goal there with, from the design, you know, again, going back to design decisions, the goal is to focus you on the API of the package. You really don't care about how internal, like if you're using Go source code, if you're using packages, you don't care about anything except for their public interface. And their public interface is not limited to just the methods of a class. You don't feel constrained to be doing like object-oriented things on a package. You can have all these types which are essentially objects. They have methods, they have internal state that you can manipulate. But the interface of your program, of your like little module, is not constrained to just an object. It can be other things as well. Now this can be good and can be bad. In a sense, you're throwing out like 30 years of object-oriented experience there, right? But I think that the flexibility to do that might be beneficial. And if you look at what the standard library intends for you to use as a package, it's very small. A package is rarely more than three files in the Go standard library, uh, and rarely more than, I would say, a thousand lines of code. So we want to focus on the package API. And we have this interesting interface-oriented type system, which is a little bit like compile time duct typing. That's like a metaphor that you can use for it, although, as we'll see, it's not true duct typing. That's um, not possible. And we'll have to do this again. All right, much better. So we're in the jungle, and then there's an animal interface. So notice how before I said type credit card struct, now it's type animal interface, and it's just a different type of type. Um, an interface is a collection of methods that if, you're, if you as an object have all of those methods with the same signature, so the same type of arguments and the same type of output, uh, you are said to fulfill that interface and you can be passed in polymorphically to any function that uses that. So we have a predator interface where they eat the, the animal. The lion is another, like, it's an actual struct, it's an object. Uh, and the lion can eat prey, which is an animal, so it fulfills the predator interface. But the lion has other things it can do as well. And so, this is f cool because you can kind of just like 
build up uh, you can build up functions that like take a particular type at first, a uh, particular struct type that is, and then when you want to do polymorphic things, you just sort of think up to yourself, well, well, what's the minimum interface that I need to make this work? Then you change what the argument of the function is from a struct type to an interface type, and then you can just add those methods to your other objects, and you can pass them in. It makes for very like extensible code. Um, but it's not true duct typing because you cannot call hunter.roar there in the feed function even if you pass in a lion because the compiler has no way of knowing that you're actually gonna pass in a lion. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, so in true duct typing in, in Python or Ruby, you could just pass in whatever you want there and call any functions you want, but they're not compiled. Okay, so what does that make you do? You emphasize polymorphism and composition over inheritance. Go doesn't really have inheritance. If you declare a struct type that only has one member variable, then you do automatically get the methods of that member variable. It's sort of just assumed that you want to re-implement those sort of things. But it's not explicit inheritance, and you can't really do anything beyond that. Um, so a question you want to answer to yourself is that like, if Go is forcing you down this path, if Go is constraining you to only use composition and, and polymorphism, are you comfortable with that, given that it might be effective? Okay, so these first three things, I think, are not that controversial. People have seen things like them before, and people have kind of accepted them. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about has been hailed as a really big step backwards by Go. Um, so, Go uses a programming language technique called a destructure and bind, if you wanna be pretentious. It just, really, it just means that functions return multiple values. And while that's not unusual, like you can do that in Python too, what is unusual is that it is extremely common for Go functions to return an, an output value and an error. And then you check if the error happened and that's how you know if something has gone wrong. Go does have an exception-like mechanism, but it is extremely discouraged to use it. The attitude you're supposed to have is that exceptions are for truly bizarre circumstances, like you're, you know, you can't write to the hard drive or something like that, and your program just has to stop. Um, exceptions are not for errors. So uh, let's get another example of this. So here's our main package. We import a couple things. We import errors, fumped, and mathrand. We do a complicated operation that basically just returns a string or an error. That's the syntax for multiple return values. You declare them in parens. Uh, and the way it works is that if math.rand is greater than 0.5, you return success and nil, no error. Otherwise, you return empty string and an error. And then you're, in your client code, you sort of do this, you get an error out, you check if the error is nil, if it is, oh, sorry, if it's not nil, if it's not nil, you handle it somehow by saying, oh no. Otherwise, you just print out the output and go on with your life. So, that's the idea. Do not treat errors as unusual or exceptional. Errors happen and suffer all the time. And the idea is that we, if we wanna build a robust programs, we should treat them as normal and treat them as part of our normal control flow. So I think that this is by far the most controversial part of what Go is trying to do. People really don't like this. Exceptions have been seen as a good step forward, and I think in a ton of cases, they really are. Um, the cool thing about this is that there's no surprises in your code. When you write Ruby code, how often is it possible for a, a, a standard function that you call to accept? You, basically always actually don't know. Like in Rails, we have kind of had this convention that like if it has a bang at the end of it, it probably might accept if the save fails or if the lookup fails of some active record model, right? But for the most part, even when you're using the standard library, things can accept at any time. And you don't know, and you kind of, to a certain extent, are counting on that to happen to tell you when errors are happening. But in this, in this way of writing code, we can just we know exactly where the errors are gonna come from, um, and we can try to handle them up front. Now, there's huge disadvantages associated with doing it this way. I think we can kind of already see them coming. One is that it's so noisy. Like, honestly, like, this main function could be like three lines of code or two lines of code if we just ignored the error value, right? If we just could count on the complicated operation to throw an exception and terminate normal operation if it, got, if it ran into like a bad case, then we could actually just return the value directly 
and skip everything else. It's much more concise that way, right? The other, and I think the worst problem with this is that you kind of have an, you land into a pretty bad quandary about how do you handle errors. Um, so here's the question. Do you catch, if you're writing like a middleware, a middle module, do you catch an error from a lower level one and then re-raise it as a more specific thing or do you just propagate it through? Because at some level, your top level code that's manipulating some abstraction, they don't really care about the specific error. They wanna know like which kind of, they wanna operate at the same level of, ab of abstraction at every uh, function call, right? And so if you get some random, like completely unrelated error that's from you know, eight, eight frames down the call stack, like you don't know what to do with it. There's no possible way you can have like a case statement around that. Um, on the other hand, so if you catch and re-raise, you lose context. And you don't necessarily know, like you know, okay, so my middleware broke, but why did it break? So that's a problem. And I think that you can kind of balance concerns there. You can have mechanisms for giving you more insight into the low level errors even when you can operate uh, th through some sort of case statement uh, type operation on the high level errors. The other concern that you have is, okay, so imagine you are just saving something to the database, right? It's gonna, it's gonna travel down your like application code and go all the way down to the bottom. It's gonna enter some library that you have never probably read the source code of and hopefully it's gonna save your stuff, right? Um, but what happens if you accidentally forget to check the error value of that call? If the database library doesn't throw an exception and it just returns an error value and you forget about that, you're gonna have an extremely hard to find bug, right? Because you're gonna think that stuff is saving because you're not checking and then you're just gonna move on and some other part of your system will break. So you kind of have a dilemma which is that you have to really, really be confident that all parts of your system are checking error values correctly. Um, whereas if you could count on the database library to just throw an exception, you don't have to be explicit about it. You can just assume it will happen. So what is the agenda? I mentioned that there's an agenda. RubHype wants you to write small, composable packages that do one thing well and that become more generic the more they're used. Uh, he wants you to focus on the design of these package APIs, but you have these questions, who does error handling and how? And where does business logic live? One thing that we've learned from a lot of MVC frameworks is that you can say that business logic lives in your models, but really things like presentation logic still have to be, they still have to have a place to live. And you're never gonna get to the point where, like, unless, like, I would say that Rails is the only generic framework that really handles this, I mean, aside from like Django or something, but the, uh, sorry, excuse me, the point I'm trying to make here is that presentation logic is business logic. You can't ever just compose modules of generic packages to do everything. You're gonna have to have several separate layers of where business logic will live. And so we traditionally call these views controllers and models or services and so forth. But Go is, has a little bit of trouble with this because if you're trying to make your packages as generic as possible, you almost want everything to be like a library. And I think that the fact that we all write a lot of code that uses this enormous library Rails, but we still have a lot of code to write, if that makes any sense. Okay, so here's an example of something I don't like about Go. So here's um, a find by ID function. Uh, this is a little bit similar to something we had at Braintree at one point. Um, we have since kind of moved away from Go. Uh, but so we have a, we're in the user package. We have some errors that we import, you know, um, and we can say, find my ID. We get the database connection. We run the select statement on the ID with the user model, which I have not shown here. Um, and if we have an error, we return the user and an error. We also check if the, to make sure that we only got one user. Oh, sorry, uh, no, we, we check to make sure that we got a user and we return an error. So, there's two things that are hard here. One is that we're returning a user no matter what, and that's enforced by the compiler. If we were returning a pointer to a user, we could return nil, but we're not. So it's possible that if our client code for this was dumb and didn't check the error code, it would think it got out a user, but in fact it just got like a dummy kind of like nude up user that has no real attributes. It has like the default value for all attributes. 
So again, it's like you have to count on people to check these error values, and that can become a little bit uh, nerve-wracking at points. And also just like compare this with the Ruby implementation. Like that to me is so much more clean. It's so much more clear like what's going on. Um, verbosity is, it's a price to pay for if you're gonna get the benefits of a compiled and type checked language. And I think that like Go even does a good job of like, look at how little type declaration here, there is here. The only real type declaration is in the signature of the method and, of the function in this case, actually. And in this type conversion, this is, a, this is saying uh, cast the first member of the, array, of the result array to a user. And I guess the syntax highlighter here, which is in JavaScript, somehow thinks that the brace is part of the zero. It's not. OK. So yeah, the Go code looks way worse. It's noisier. I would say it's probably harder to interpret the output because the Ruby code is gonna either return a user or it's gonna blow up, right? If not on uh, a, no, a no method error on the dot first or it'll return nil, right? So where do we go from here? I think that I've shown some advantages to writing code in Go and some disadvantages. And I think that we could also step back a little bit and, and, and sort of think about why we are interested, why do we care? Because for me, like, I like Go. It's very fun to write in, but I think that we can't be sure that we want to do, like, switch all our production environments to this. So what's the point of going through this and learning this new language? Um, people say that you become a better developer when you know more languages. But is that really true? Like, you can't write more than one thing at once. You're not just better because you can write plus one languages. You're better because exposure to more examples of what you're doing allows you to generalize your understanding of your craft. You can, you can extract an abstract idea of what programming is, and that's very difficult to do from just one language, or even from just two or three. You should learn as many languages as you can. But what you also have to do is you have to go back to your old language and apply the paradigms that you've, like the new paradigms, the new styles. You have to apply everything that you've learned. It's very easy to be like, I'm gonna write Ruby, you know, type, 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 and then switch over and like, okay, now I'm writing Scala, type, 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 and just apply nothing. Like, I have Ruby mode and I have Scala mode, they're not related. Um, that's very easy to do and I think it's a trap and it will inhibit the way you learn. Um, but the best part about this is that you get to understand the style of your language in a way that you never had before. If you just come into the world and you just start writing Ruby, like, you're never gonna be able to understand the trade-offs that people made when they were thinking about the correct way to write Ruby, the, the idiomatic way to write Ruby. You can only understand trade-offs when you have outside experience. Okay. And there's also a, a broader point here about the programming language community. Um, Programming language communities are extremely different from each other. Um, Ruby is known for testing, for kind of being a slow language, for being extremely expressive and extremely ab abstract. Um, but if you go to Java, you know, it's gonna be a totally different thing. And one thing you'll notice is that like, one of the most different things about it will be the tool chain, will be the dependency management, will be the way you deploy your code. All this stuff that you kind of spend a lot of your time doing, but you've never really seen, if you've only done Ruby, you've, you'll never have seen a different way of doing things. Um, it can be difficult to judge the practices of your community until you're fairly deep into them. It can also be difficult to, I think that you should be a little bit deliberately humble when you're learning a new, a new language and immersing yourself in a new community. Like, if you were gonna all start learning Clojure right now, you would probably use Linogen, the standard package manager. You wouldn't say, no, 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 I know better. If you were installing RVM, you know, you'll do the same thing. So the takeaway point here is that working with programmers is a social act. You, know, you, you can't deny the influence of your peers and think that you're just like programmer person sitting in a room typing away. Um, and there's a specific area I wanna talk about here because I feel like we did some code comparisons a little bit. I think I outlined what I think is an accurate representation of Go's style and nowhere does this have more of an impact than on what you consider to be idiomatic code or the right way to write code. Um, and another question I wanna raise is that Go and the language designers behind it, they have a very specific idea of how to write code. They have something in mind. Did Matt's necessarily have 
the Ruby way of writing code in mind when he designed the language 20 years ago? I don't think so. And I think that, like, there's something we said. Um, I always remember a quote from, I actually don't remember his name. It's the guy who wrote V8, the V8 compilation language uh, for JavaScript, the compilation engine. He said something about, we make it fast. We don't really care about whether or not we need the speed. But we make it fast because people will build things on top of the speed that we can't think of. And that's why Google invests in the V8 language. It's also to keep the web alive. Yeah. But okay, what is idiomatic code? One definition would be that idiomatic code uses the language effectively. It leverages the semantics and syntax of your favorite language to get stuff done. Um, I think it's a good definition of like good code, of effective code. I don't think that this is what idiomatic really means. To me, idiomatic means it's the community standard way of doing something. And again, we all know what this actually looks like. There's a million ways to do most things in Ruby, but there's only a small, relatively small set of ways of doing things that we look at all the time, right? And that's good. That's very good. Because familiarity when you're looking at code is incredibly important. Think about C++. Does anyone know offhand how many keywords there are in C++? Yes, a lot. That's a fair one. I looked it up before this talk. There's 63. So does anyone really think that anyone except for the grandmasters who have written the compilers understand how these keywords interact with each other? No, no one does. Everyone picks their favorite 20% of the language and uses that. And so there's no such thing, I would say there's no such thing as idiomatic C++. Maybe there is in specific problem domains. But there's no way that you can have such a broad possible way of doing things and understand it all unless the community converges on some standard practices. And that's really what we've been very lucky to have happen in Ruby. Um, and there's a, a, a question, why is familiarity important? Because when you read and write and critique code, you have to go through stages, right? You have to say, how is this person doing whatever it is they're doing? What are they doing? And to do that, you have to kind of look at the structure. You have to understand the way they're assigning variables and moving stuff around. But really what you want to do at the end of the day is say, why are they doing it this way? Why did they choose to, like, I don't know, call this function instead of pushing it down a level? Why did they choose to structure their APIs this way? It's like the why is what you want. And the more time you have to spend parsing what they're doing and understanding how they're doing it, and uh, it's less time, less brain power that you can expand on critiquing the why. OK, so just as a closing I, uh, series of remarks about, like, programming languages in general and why I think that even if we don't like the kind of patronizing style of the Go language, um, you still might be interested in it. It's because the syntax and semantics influence what idiomatic code converges on in very subtle ways. So here's a question again. Is the goal of a language designer to push programmers into writing good code naturally, into making good code idiomatic? I think that like Rob Pike might say yes. I'm not sure what people who write Perl or Ruby would say. Um, but here's an accidental example, or what I think might be accidental. I think that this style of writing a test is awesome. This is RSpec, right? Um, you can be mad at me for using RSpec if you want. It is a testing example too. It describes what you want to do, and it goes and does it. Um, and we're only able to do that because Ruby doesn't require that you have parens around your function calls, and because if the last argument of your function is a block, you don't have to have a comma there, right? Otherwise, you have to have comma do block. And I think that like when Matt was designing Ruby 20 years ago, he made this kind of, it's a syntactic decision. There's no language semantics that have changed here at all. It makes life harder for the, com like the people writing Ruby interpreters. There's no doubt about that. But it's a pretty minor syntactic decision overall. I think it opens up a world of like being able to write beautiful tests and beautiful code. So I think that overall, I'm hesitant to say that the approach of writing such a directed language is a good idea. I think it might work out. I think that everyone here should go and try it. Um, try writing some Go code. Try to wrap your head around how, how to handle errors effectively, because if there's one thing I've learned, uh, it's that Error handling is hard. So yeah, be critical of your language um, and learn more languages. But we should also step back and give a lot of respect to the people who have done them, because this is really hard stuff to get right. 
Um, so we have lots of time for questions, about 10 minutes.